are so happy that you are able to join us this evening for this very special Black History Month celebration. Um, as Haitian Americans, it is really important for us to celebrate Black history and also honor our Haitian culture while we're doing that. If you understand um, American history, you understand the impact of the slave rebellion on the U.S., particularly um, on Louisiana and New Orleans, and how much Haitian influence has influenced Haitian cuisine has influenced um, that culture. We'll get into that a little bit later. Let's get into the reason why we're here. We're here because I have my friend Chef Adam Mayer, award-winning chef, traveling chef who flew all the way from Miami to bless, to bless us with his, with his planet presence today. And I'm not going to do a lot of talking. I'm going to turn it to the man of the hour um, to let us know what he'll be making for us today. Good evening, Chef. What Good are you evening, making today? Thank you for having me. I want to say thank you also to the associations of Asian professionals and Mongol Akai for having me as a guest for tonight's cooking class. It's an honor to be back here in the DMV. Um, what we're going to do tonight is a stewed chicken with cashews, but more precisely, we're using guinea fowl, right? So, okay. um, in Haiti, we're more accustomed with the guinea fowl traditionally. It is something that we have, um, not so much the other chicken that we know that's in the store. So, this is pretty much uh, more, more tough than the traditional chicken that we know. So this is what we use in Haiti. So this is what we're gonna use. So we have the guinea fowl, we have some spices, we have also, uh, of course, cashews, which is one of the star ingredients in this recipe. Just um, just so people are aware, since it's, we don't wanna keep you guys here for like four or five hours, right? <laughs> so some of the stuff were pre-processed. For example, this, this chicken normally we already uh, cleaned it with um, with lime juice and um, vinegar, and we also shoddy. Right? What is shoddy? Shoddy is pretty much um, running it through boiling water. You know, um, the reason being is it helps remove any extra gunk or the little feathers that are still sticking into the yeah. pores, okay. and to the, and also something that most people don't know is it also helps kill some of the bacteria. Um, no refrigeration back in the day, so we had to do what we had to do. And that's where the lemon juice, the sour orange, the vinegar comes into play. So our poultry or whatever proteins we had spent the whole day out. So we had to clean it pretty much so we can kill whatever bacteria grows on. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna process this. So we're gonna cut it into pieces. Okay. And then we're gonna season it with our Haitian hippies that we have. Right. And what goes in the Haitian hippies, okay, chef? So Haitian hippies, mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know, is the holy grail of Haitian cuisine. So um, it has spices, as in uh, parsley, okay. thyme. Scallions, or um, we call it here in English leeks. Or um, you have scotch bonnet pepper, of course, for that for that spicy kick. Um, garlic, and um, some people add also green peppers or red peppers, uh, onions. It depends on the taste you're going for, but the bases are those ingredients plus something acidic, lemon juice or sour orange or vinegar, whichever floats your boat. Okay. And I know that in Haiti, like traditionally, we would mix all of those up in something like this, like a pilaf. Yes, a mortar, yes. But here in the U.S., you know, we process it separately. Yeah. I mean, How long can that be preserved for if okay. processed that? Uh, if processed, it can last a good amount of time, especially because of the acidity in it, and so it's going to keep long, you can keep it in your fridge for for weeks, I would say, well, it's not going to last a week because you're going to use it most of the time, so, but if it were to stay in your fridge, it would stay probably, a, I would say, a good couple of weeks, okay. um, especially if you have a tight seal on it, or you can freeze it too. Oh, okay. And so you can okay. freeze it, and um, 
use it as you need. Like I can give you guys some tips. Um, if you don't want to freeze it in bulk, use an ice cube tray and pour it in the ice cube trays and freeze okay. them. So whenever you need a piece, pop it out. You get the ice cube, okay. an a piece cube, and you use it. Oh wow, that's really good. I'm gonna start doing that. So you can preserve it the longest, or if you want, use a vacuum sealer okay. and just seal it because the vacuum sealer removes all the oxygen out of it. Okay. So oxygen is really what makes it um, get um, moldy or bad because that bacterias love oxygen, so that's, okay. that's what gets them to grow. Okay. So you can do that. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So now we have the three piece in. Okay. We're going to use some kosher salt, sea salt. Okay. You know, and just mix it in there, you know. Um, usually, I would suggest letting this marinate for, you know, four, three to four hours. Okay. Or if you want, you can marinate it overnight. Okay. So that all your spices can get in there. And when you're eating it, you know, you're eating some real traditional Haitian food, right? That's good. That's you know, good. we love our apis, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, do you use apis for everything Haitian or are there Haitian dishes where you don't necessarily need to use any apis? Um, I mean, huh. if you're looking at it, yes, we do use apis in almost everything that we do. Um, when, I'm, when I want to give people really traditional Haitian cuisine, I do use apis for everything, but if I want to do a little twist, I, you know, I, I use some other spices, and you can tweak your apis too. So apis doesn't have to specifically be what we do, because apis means pretty much spice. Okay. So, but um, if you want to stay in the lane of traditional, you don't want to offend people, and you don't want people to bury you, so you do have to use the apis, right? Yeah. Um, I guess the only time we don't use apis is when doing dribla. Okay. okay. And so, what is Julie Blanc for the non-Haitian speech? Just plain, all good white rice that goes with everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, so the next step is we're going to sear the chicken. So, not bad couleur. I'm not going to sear it. You know, not return, you know. Okay. So, the key ingredient is to use a very heavy duty pan okay. and also to make sure that your your heat is on high and you want the pan to be really hot because the moment the, the protein or whatever ingredient you're going in, mm -hmm. the pot hits it, you want it to start sizzling. You don't want to see it soaking in there and then that's when you see juices coming out and then it's pretty much boiling instead of really searing. Okay. So searing is really much like a flash frying. Okay, to get the color. To get the color. I think it gets the color on it and it gives an extra flavor also. I get it. And Chef, what is the best type of oil for searing? I know some people like to use olive oil. For searing, mm -hmm. especially if you want to sear um, tough meats or stuff like that or big pieces of meat, mm -hmm. you want to use a, a, an oil that has a high smoking point. High smoking point means that it can tolerate heat to a certain level before it starts smoking. So you see most of the time when you're using like, like olive oil, like it doesn't take long for you can see the smoke coming out. Okay. So because it's at a low smoking point. So for searing, you can use vegetable oil or canola oil, which are really good uh, high smoking point. But if you're not allergic to peanuts, so you can use peanut oil also. But then that changes the flavors. You want to use something neutral. Okay, that's you know, good to know. Especially that vegetable oil is pretty much neutral. Okay. It's not going to change the flavors of what we're doing. Okay. Very good. So I'm pretty sure we're getting close to where we're going. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now we're going to... Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another key component about mm -hmm. stealing, okay. you don't want to put too much of the ingredients in your pot at the same time. Okay. Because what does happen is, once you put too much, the temperature of the oil and the pan goes down. Okay. And when that happens, you're boiling instead of frying. I see. Or stirring, right? So not a lot of Yeah. Okay. So we do a bad batch. That's why food is a love language. 
Okay. You have to treat it like somebody that you love, that you care about. You want to be patient. You want to be attentive to it. Okay. You know, you got to treat it with gently, with it gently, you know. It's just like a flower, like a lady, you know. <laughs> so you want to do that, right? Treat your food like a lady, guys. Yes, definitely. So, <laughs> okay. so, go ahead. So, Chad, I know some of us have seen you on Cutthroat Kitchen, and recently we saw you impress the chef on um, Shop. But tell us, don't know who you are. Tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what inspired you to become a chef, and, you know, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, well, I was born and raised in, uh, in Puerto Rico, and I'm a big lover of food. You know, like whether I'm cooking it or I'm eating it, I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, so growing up, traditionally in Haiti, we know that um, it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There's no in between, really. Mm -hmm. So when um, I wanted to eat on my side, I was not able to. Mm -hmm. I was so, oh, suddenly I eat every morning. So I started paying attention to what they were doing in the kitchen. I started paying attention to what my mom was doing, the cook was doing, my grandma, and I would just be like, okay, so I waited until my mom is not home anymore or nobody's there. So I go to the outside kitchen and I just started cooking for myself. Oh wow. Right? And I just I, I burned a lot of pots in the court, <laughs> but I started getting the hang of it to the point where my friends he came like guinea pigs. Yeah. Came along to the house. I cooked for them. And till I started getting the hang of it. And that's when I realized that I like entertaining. Okay. Right? But let's remember also that back then in Haiti, um, that going to be my age a little bit away now. Mm -hmm. So like 25 years ago, food was not something like really professional as a career. And so I didn't know really if this was something that I wanted to do as a career. Okay. So I just knew that I liked it to show you. Okay. And, you know, along the way, and then again, you know, there's this typical thing that that's why I say my little Right, yeah. Right, so it was a challenge, but the moment that I figured out this is what I wanted to do, and I started falling, I had to go for it. Wow, okay. Now I'm looking at the PC. This white coloration. It smells amazing. I'm already hungry, but huh? my stomach is growling. Well this smells really good. <laughs> so we have a nice coloration here. Yeah. Yeah. So while we're getting these spheres, we can start doing our rice also. Okay. So that's why I have the rice here. Okay. Um, I'm using the basmati rice. Ooh, that long grain rice. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And. What we're doing pretty much right now is washing it so we can remove uh, some extra starch. Alright? Okay. Like, in Haiti, we wash it for two reasons. Because sometimes, you know, we get the rice straight from the farmers. Okay. So there's a lot of dirt and um, other particles. You know, these are Right. Yeah. So that's like the. Um, the pie is pretty much the husk of the rice that okay. we're talking about. Okay. Right? So we want to make sure that we remove that. Okay. So, and also we do it because rice is starchy. Mm -hmm. And depending on how grainy or not fat, but pretty much, you know, condensed you want it to be, you have to rinse it so you can use it. Right? So we're mm -hmm. going to rinse the rice out. Okay. And do that. But in the meantime, Ooh, that's beautiful. Cheers, too much done. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, um, since we're in a short time, I have like a batch of chicken already in the fresh cooker. So we're going to add this to it. Okay. And we're going to... Yeah. That's amazing. Chef, the exciting part about this being a, a class where folks can learn, we're making it interactive. And we have 
a question from one of our from one of our audience members. Okay. They yeah. would like to know what is your favorite dish to cook. Wow, that's a oof, that's a tough question. Um, favorite dish to cook for myself or people? That that would be it. Um, Try it both. First, tell us for people, and then for yourself. For myself, I like to eat comfort food. Okay. Um, I like to eat stuff that I can do really fast. Okay. So I don't like spending too much time in the kitchen because of myself. Okay. Um, but um, if you say favorite food to eat, I would say at the top of the list, you have legume. Ooh, yes. Um, you have oxtail, yes. short ribs. Um, I love Korean cuisine and I love also Italian cuisine. Okay. Um, what, I, what I love to cook for others, I don't want to say specific dish, but I want to say um, specific items, you know, um, mm -hmm. seafood, steaks, um, so I would say those are the lanes that I love to stay in, right? Yes. So that's pretty much where I stay at that. <laughs> Now I want to know. I want to know also that the the pan that the pot that we use for the steel <laughs> we're gonna still use it. That's how we're gonna do our foundation for the sauce. Ooh, okay. Right. So mm -hmm. you wanna still keep that because that all the flavors are in there. Okay. Right? So, I see you have a nice pot. So when we yeah. are not making rice in a rice cooker for Haitian style, that's, that's what, that shows you. Yeah. What is the best type of to use for that. Um, you want to use a heavy, heavy duty pan, you know, okay. because you don't want the rice to burn too fast on the bottom. Okay. So this is what we want to use. Okay. Oh. So. Right now I'm just gonna add some of my stock mm -hmm. to the pressure. to the pressure cooker. Okay. So we can get this going on. I like how we're doing, you know, a little bit of modern, the yeah. new meets the old, the because meets the old, yes. you mentioned that pulled zoo or guinea fowl is like a very hard type of chicken, so without a pressure cooker, how long would you say that one would have to cook this? On the stove? Yeah. Probably a good amount of hours. Um, a good amount of hours, yes. So now we're gonna set it off for 30 minutes. Okay. And I'm oh, sorry. Here you go. Now listen to now that you So we have our chicken the file in the pressure cooker already going. Okay. We're seasoning it with AP, some salt. Okay. Sear it and a pressure cooker with some chicken stock, and then we let it cook. This is going on. So next step is we're gonna keep going on our rice. So okay. we're gonna the rice. Okay. So we're gonna give it one last rinse. Wow. So that's three rinses. Three rinses. Yes. Okay. Right. I I don't like my rice my rice to be too packed. What is packed? Sticky. <laughs> like, like I like my rice sticky when it's sushi, but other than that, I, 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 I want to be able to not eat like I'm eating baby food, right? Grainy. Grainy, yes. Yeah. You know, not hard, but grainy, you know, like, I want, I, I want when I'm looking at the rice for the rice, you can be like, huh, you know, so. <laughs> Alright, I'm excited to see how, you know, how you just make the rice that makes you always like. Yeah, so we're going to go really basic. You know, we're going to put some oil in it. Mm -hmm. We're going to take some scallions. Okay. Um, probably add a couple cloves of garlic. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty much going to add this to the fire. Oh, you just went for it. Okay. Went for it. So are these the foundation for creating that Haitian flavor yes. in rice? You yes. need the scallion? Yeah, the scallion and the garlic, yes. Okay. Now my little add-on is lemongrass. Oh, okay. I know that Haitians love, use lemongrass for, for tea. See, yes, right? Right? yes. In Asian culture, mm -hmm. lemongrass is used in cooking as well. And I, since I love Asian cuisine, so I love to use lemongrass okay. sometimes, especially when it comes for the plain white rice. 
it gives it that citrusy smell, the aroma, mm. taste that you know, and it, it, it gives it a little contrast. So we're gonna just salt it lightly in the pot. Okay. Then, and, mm -hmm. What we use for lemon glass is it a little bit? I see you use like a nice, nice shot. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm looking for that flavor. Okay. Right? So yes. while we're doing this, uh -huh. I like to balsamic. Okay. I can. Right? I can stop. I like to balsamic. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in and uh -huh. continue working on our chicken. So okay. Now this is the sauce part. Okay. Like I said you save the same pot. Put it throw it away. And now we're gonna add our tomato paste, pat tomat. Okay. We're gonna about three. Okay. We're gonna fry, right? You're so gonna fry the tomato paste. Tomato paste. Okay. The and what is that used for? It is you 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 take out that that uh it's I don't wanna say canned taste. There's a canned taste to it too. Okay. But there's that strong taste. Okay. And the tomato paste that, that is made is pretty much like tomato that's been um, cooking for a long time and dried and stuff like that. So you want to take off that that flavor. You want it to cook a little bit. It's just like if you're doing a roux okay. or to get a, a sauce, like a, a cheese sauce, stuff like that. So you want to cook down the flour to take out that, that flavor from the flour, right? Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, Chef, I know a little bit earlier you mentioned, you know, about Haitian men not traditionally being in the kitchen and you having to hide a little bit. What obstacles um, did you have to overcome to become a chef and, you know, a prominent one within the alcohol? Well, I would say that the first obstacle was from, oh, from parents and close family members and friends. Okay. Um, like I said, 25 years ago, like, why, it would, it, would, it was something that nobody was thinking about as a career, right? Okay. So when I first said that this is something that I really want to do, mm -hmm. like nobody supported it. Wow. Nobody. Everybody was like, what? Are you crazy? You want to go to culinary school to cook? You want to go to college to learn how to cook? I'm going to the house. I'll teach you. Right? But, I mean, you can't blame them. You know, culturally for us, it was not something that it was a career. Right. Right? We didn't understand it. We don't know about it. It's like women is in the kitchen, not men, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you were men in the kitchen, they probably looked at you a little sideways. Okay. But um, it's something that I really enjoy to do. And like I said, I, I love entertaining. And I found it that I can entertain through food also. Mm, okay. So since I was able to entertain to food, and I stuck to it. Okay. Um, I had a friend that was attending this co uh, college in Florida called Johnson & Wales. Shout out to Johnson & Wales. And she told me, hey, come visit the school. They do have culinary programs. So I went there. Mm -hmm. As soon as I walked in, and she started talking, and the classrooms were pretty much glass. Okay. And I saw what was going on, and I'm like, listen, sign me up. Mm. I almost like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, like, nah, mom, this is what I'm going to do. So they wanted me to do more to management, like hospitality management and stuff. You know, Haitians, you know, focus manager, doctor, lawyer. Um, if you're not one of those, you're pretty not doing anything with your life. But this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I signed up for it, but I signed up not knowing what I was getting myself into. Okay. Right? Yes. And what is, I see that you had some water prepared already that you're using both for the rice and your sauce. Yes, it's a, it's a chicken stock. Okay, okay. Uh, chicken stock or chicken broth. You know. Okay. Um, you can buy the broth already in the containers at okay. the store, mm -hmm. or you can make it yourself. Uh, you make it yourself, you know, you just use leftover vegetables, bones, whichever bones you want to use, and you just make your stock. Okay. Um, normally it takes about six to eight hours to cook to get to that flavor that you're looking for. But, um, you know, we have it here, so we're using it. Okay. So we can make the sauce that we're going to use okay. to make the chicken swim and right? Swim, okay, nice. Yes. And then we're using it also for the rice. You don't want to use plain water. Okay. Right, you want to use something flavorful. If you don't eat meat, you can use a vegetable stock. 
Okay. That's the flavor. Okay. You know, water, plain water is boring when you're cooking. <laughs> okay. Right. We want flavors. You wanna, you wanna be able to to see to to taste the different flavors going to your mouth, not just apes. You know, just all the flavors too. Okay. And please don't crucify me. I'm laughing. No problem. with Apes. Just. Okay. Um, I think we're finishing your story. Sorry, I think I cut you off right there because I wanted to go. To know exactly what this broth was, yes. um, I think you were. Well, yeah. So, how you... yeah. So when I, I decided to get into it, but I did not know really what I was getting myself into, mm -hmm. pretty much. But and it it took me along the years during college, you know, during college, to get more acquainted with the field because again, you know, you grew up in Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, you were not really accustomed to this. To culinary as a career, you didn't have no examples. I didn't have no chefs to look up to, no black chefs, no Asian chefs to look up to. If they were, if they existed, we didn't know about them in Haiti at the time. Okay. Right? At least I didn't know about them. So I decided to pursue this career pretty much on the back of me mm -hmm. just loving food. Okay. Purely simple, but I loving food, wanting to cook for myself when I wanted to. Okay. Right. So that's what it is. So now um, we're going to try to finish setting up this rice. We're going to okay. make it boiling. So as soon as the water boils, you add your rice? Yes. Now, you say you don't like for your rice to be fat. No. So people who want to get perfect rice but may not be measuring, you know, with like a cup like that, how do you ensure that this rice is going to be good? Eh? Like you said, put it up, that will hot, milk fat or tough, or packed. Well, you know, first thing first, let's make sure that it doesn't come out fat. You know, so <laughs> yes, I don't like fat. Yes. We don't want fat. So. How do you get um, that perfect? I mean, you just follow the ratios. Um, okay. You know, it's uh, a cup and a half of, well, for, especially for the basmati, mm -hmm. it's a cup and a half of water or liquid for a cup of rice. A cup and a half of the basmati and. No, a cup and a half of water. Of water. So one cup of basmati. Oh, okay. So the two and one ratio will make two it and fat. Two and one ratio, you, you can do it for other types of rice. Okay. Rice, or uh, it will make it a little bit more, more fat, right? Okay. So we're going to let our, our rice pretty much simmer a little bit. So now in, the, in this pan, remember we have the chicken stock and we have the pato, my right? And yes. The drippings of the chicken. Yes. And then now, okay, yes. um, we're going to do what is called bouquet garni. Oh, bouquet sounds gar fancy. Bouquet garni is pretty much a French term mm -hmm. for um, a bomb, a, a spice bomb. Okay. Pretty much a spice bomb. So, um, traditionally you have thyme, okay. parsley stems, garlic, cloves, Peppercorn and stuff like that. That uh, since we're Haitian, we're gonna add a little bit ten. more depth to it. So we have mm -hmm. ten. Um, we're gonna take the whole parsley. Oh wow! All right. Mhm. Mm add to it. Um, traditionally, it doesn't come with uh, pima, but we're gonna put the pima in it. Okay. So that if the pima bursts. It doesn't stay inside of the pan with the, somebody don't bite on it, so you just remove that. it. Yeah. And that's a pretty much the, the idea behind um, the bouquet garni is so yes. that the spices and the herbs that you're leaving in it whole, mm -hmm. so that you can just remove them easily. That's good, particularly for clove. We want it all, more don't so So clove. That's everybody's pet peeve. Imagine yes. you're enjoying a nice plate of food and you know you bite into a piece of clove. Mm -hmm. I love this and I'm gonna start using that because I love using clove in my food, so I'm glad I'm learning this. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and I love the flavor of cloves, but I just don't love biting into it. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, I agree, me too. So um we have another question um from one of our viewers. Okay. They would like to for you to speak a little bit as a person who really loves food, um, the difference between enjoying food for like the experience versus you know because uh, uh, you know we like our big you know flat too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and but let me just make sure that people understand that this is food grade. So this is not some toile hey, that okay. I just picked out of my closet. <laughs> okay. So this is food grade. This is specifically 
Before Fuck that. cooking. Okay. Yeah, it's, not gonna, it's, not gonna, it's, it's not gonna burn. It's not gonna disintegrate. It's made specifically for that. So we add it to this, to this, and it's gonna grab all those flavors. Okay. You know, and we want to make sure that also we season. So when you said food grade, so if someone wants to make that, they have to make sure they buy food grade one. Yes. Where can they get something like that? Um, you can find it at most stores. You can okay. just ask for cheesecloth. It's called cheesecloth. Oh, okay. And you can buy it. Or And if you're not putting the clothes or the peppercorns, mm -hmm. you can just use a uh, cooking twine. Okay. To tie up the parsley and the uh -huh. thyme. Okay. And, okay. and then scallions also if you want to add to it. Right? Okay. okay. So we're just going to... Cover it just a little bit and let it simmer, right? Okay. And we have a rice on. So now you did ask me a great question, mm -hmm. right? Yes. All right. So there are two types of cook of eating. Okay. Eating the physiological uh, aspect of it. Okay. And there's the eating, the enjoying part of it, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes. I believe that go. You need to be able to experience food, right? That's eating for the just the enjoyment, the experience, trying something different, okay. you know. And I encourage people to do that. Go out, go eat, experience something different. Don't go out and order the same food that you order every week when you go out. Um, life is so short, and food is so vast that we want to be able to enjoy food for what it is. It might not taste well, well, like what we grew up on, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it's not good. There's never no bad food unless it's really bad. Oh, worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, not even worse. <laughs> some people do eat worse because, I mean, it's, it's in their culture. But mm -hmm. you might not like the flavors, the difference, the nuances and stuff like that. Okay. But it's the same way. That person from that culture can see your food as bad. Okay. So that's why I never like to say, oh, it's bad. Because I don't like it. I might say I don't like it, I don't prefer it, but it's not bad. Okay. Great example is if you ever get a chance to visit Atlanta, mm -hmm. you can go at the, and no, Coca Cola does not sponsor this segment. You can go to the Coca Cola factory and they have different stations mm -hmm. where you can taste sodas from different countries or continents. Okay. I guarantee you, the moment that you taste a soda from Asia, you might spit it up mm. and say, oh, this is nasty. And they might taste your Coca Cola and say, oh, this is nasty. It's because our palates are so different mm -hmm. from different areas of the world. Like in the Eastern atmosphere, they do not pair food. They don't try to make food to pair together to taste good or like our gravy is registered on this side. Whereas we, we want it to be, to be able to match or sweet and sour, this and that. Mm -hmm. Which is, if you go to an Asian restaurant, they will never eat off the buffet line. They have a separate bowl and they will eat it there. Mm -hmm. So, I see that um, our rice is already it's almost there, dry. Yeah. So how do you make sure that this rice cooks when the water has evaporated? Once the water has evaporated, you mm -hmm. cover it up. You can cover it up with a plastic film. Okay. I mean, grub it, you know, we use those, um, those supermarket bags, those thank you bags, right? <laughs> and when you're growing up, you didn't know why. You just knew you had to put the plastic over it mm -hmm. so the food can get too fit, right? Too fit. And too fit is, is, is derivative from the French term étouffé, okay. which means steamed, covered, right? Okay. Covered. So as long as your lid is tight and doesn't have any crevices or any spacings, mm -hmm. you don't need necessarily to cover with plastic film. But you can still cover it with the plastic film to make sure you assure that it steams. And you can put the plastic film and just leave it like that with no cover. Okay. And if the plastic uh -huh. is really tight on all the edges, okay. all you're gonna see is just a big a big dome. Okay. And as the rice is cooking, the dome mm -hmm. is just gonna reduce, reduce, reduce all the way until it even reaches the, the rice itself. Okay. So it's very important it's to very, do that. Okay. Yeah. So you and that's a uh, I would say that's an Asian um, technique. Okay. We see that Asians love to steam their stuff. You know, they steam their rice, they they steam the dumplings and all that stuff. So that's a great technique that okay. um, is used worldwide. So okay. no, we're not the only ones who cover our rice with plastic and steam, right? <laughs> so if I'm a little nervous about the store plastic to cover my rice, 
I know that I personally use like a Sorella. paper towel or Sorella you can or use foil. foil. You can use foil. Anything okay. that's going to cover it and not let the air come oh. out the corners. Okay. Right? So okay. you want that's what you want to use. Okay. And I saw that you reduced it. So this is for... Yes. You reduce I reduce the, the heat, heat okay. and then you cover it and then you let it go. It's the same thing with your chicken that's going on. Okay. And then you just let it go. These are... Once you set it up low, you cover it. Mm -hmm. That's what you call control temperatures. Okay. Right? This is control temperature. There's no need to freak out or like keep opening it, trying to see whatever. No. It is made for that. It will do it for okay. that. Okay. So, Next step is for the sauce. Okay. So it's have? cashew, right? Oh. So it's chicken with cashew. So what I have here, mm -hmm. I have toasted cashew halves. Okay. And I also have the cashew that I blended into a paste. Oh. And the reason why I like using the paste okay. is because one, it's going to help thicken the sauce. Okay. I don't like sauce that's runny. Like, you know, put the sauce in the plate and as you know, while you're walking, sauce is just splashing everywhere. I don't like that. I well, like my sauce to be a little bit nappy, you know, like coating. Okay. So this is going to do the trick. And it's also, since instead of using cornstarch or flour, okay. I'm using the ingredient itself as a thickening agent. Oh, wow. Okay. So the nut is going to be used as a thickening agent, mm -hmm. flavoring, and then we can use this pretty much, add some of it in the sauce, and then the rest we use it as a garnish. Okay. Okay. That's amazing. So... And we also have green peppers, and okay. red peppers, and yellow onions. Um, these are for flavor and also for the visual aspect. Okay. okay. Um, you know also that when we're cooking in Asian cuisine, we love to keep our onions and peppers a little bit raw. Okay. Not although we cook especially in sauce, right? Okay. Yes. So that also the Asians do it. Okay. Like when you see stir fry, the vegetables are not mushy, Very they're cool. crunchy. Yes. Right? Okay. But since I love flavors, mm -hmm. I'm going to take some of those, gonna cut them and add them to the sauce so we can extract as much flavor as possible from the peppers and the onions and the sauce. Whoosh. Okay. So That's good. Good. <laughs> Chef, yes. we have another great question from our amazing viewers. Um, they would like to know. Since you know you cook and you dabble in all types of cuisine, what do you think sets um, Haitian um, cuisine apart from other dishes from like other cultures? One word: our spices. Maybe. Our spices, and I want to add to the our soil, man. The the Haitian soil. Um, do this experience. If you ever go to Haiti, mm -hmm. try shallots from Haiti. Mm -hmm. Try apricot from Haiti. Mm -hmm. Try bananas from Haiti. Oh, yeah. Okay. Trust me, your life will change. Mom. Because the flavors are so different. It's so out there. You know, here we have those big shallots that pretty much look almost like an onion. Mm -hmm. Our shallots in Haiti are like this. And this little shallot can give as much kick as like probably three or four shallots that you have here in the USA. Basically, the shallots here, I don't want to say they're, don't, they're flavorless, but they don't pack as much flavors as our, as our soil. Mm -hmm. And that's that what sets Haitian uh, cuisine apart so much. You know, so much that, that um, our, and our um, slave owners knew that. So that's why they were growing sugarcane in Haiti. They brought in grocery work in Haiti. They were raising a lot of stuff in Haiti mm -hmm. so they can export and sell outside in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So they knew it, and that's what sets our food apart. Our food, like, a griot in Haiti is so different than a griot in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I don't care how seasoned you have it, how well. It's, it's something about what they eat, you know, unfortunately the trash, but <laughs> it's what they eat, you know? So... That's it's the flavors, man. That's what sets us apart. The flavors, the ingredients we use, mm -hmm. like every most every country in the Caribbean do chili blood. They do white rice. They do rice and peas, mm -hmm. red beans and rice. They do chili pole, you know, chili um, and um, where they call it gandules or pigeon peas. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't taste the same. It will never taste the same, mm -hmm. you know, because. It's part the way we cook and the ingredients that we use, the way we use the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Like, 
you can't compare sofrito with Haitian eggs, yeah. right? So sofrito is there's like Haitian is culture is so colorful. Mm -hmm. So like oh you always wanna dance, you wanna that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's life, it's love, it's colors, it's flavors, you know. So all these things together combine to create our food. Mm -hmm. So that's what sets it apart. Okay. That's really good. That's really good. So again, yeah, so tell us a little bit about, you know, how long you've been a chef and what is like uh, what's been the most exciting part of the journey okay so um, I've been cooking professionally um, I would say for 17 years now um, I would say the you said ex most exciting part of the journey mm -hmm. most exciting part of the journey um, it's learning every day um, dealing with different challenges every day, um, especially I'm a caterer, so the catering business is a is, is a field that has a lot of challenges, a lot of ups and downs, and, and things that you cannot expect, okay. right? Mm -hmm. uh, versus a restaurant, nothing. I have, I'm not saying that restaurant workers do not work hard; they do work hard. Trust me, mm -hmm. and I, that's why I don't have a restaurant because it's a different beast. Yeah. But in the catering business, it's a different animal. Because pretty much every time you go cater an event, you bring your kitchen with you. You build the mm -hmm. kitchen outside. Okay. So if something happens while you're out there, only God can save you. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. or unless you have a lot of experiences in dealing with different circumstances, then that's it. You can cover it. So now we're going to de simmer in and extract the flavors that I was saying, right? Yes. And I think your... The chicken is, yeah, it's coming. It's coming on long. Yeah. Right? Good. Yeah, it finished the um, pressure because it popped up a little bit. It popped up already. Yeah, then the cameras keep going now. Oh, yes, so, yes, yes, yes. So, so, yeah. so we got about 25 minutes, you know, before this is almost done. By the time this is done, we put in the sauce, the jimmy will be all done and ready, and hopefully it's going to be great, right? Right. Keeping right. yeah. my fingers crossed. <laughs> So that's part of my, my, my path, you know. Um, exciting part about it also is I, I get a chance to compete. Nice, um, yes. Something that, that I good. never envisioned of doing. Mm -hmm. Never. If you ever, ever asked me if I wanted to be in front of the TV mm -hmm. and compete against other chefs, I would say no. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm, unlike popular belief, I'm very shy. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like the limelight. I don't like, like, right now, there's some other people right now, I'm already nervous a little bit. It's just because it's just because I'm a perfectionist and I like to do what I'm doing, I want it to be perfect. So mm -hmm. if I'm behind the scenes, if something wrong goes up goes wrong, I, something happens bad, I can fix it without like, right. nobody knowing. Yeah. But in front of a live audience, <laughs> way flat, way flat. Yeah. <laughs> just go That's, it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's but, good. Um, I got a chance to compete on uh, twice on Food Network, which is a blessing because I know a lot of people that don't even get a chance to do it once, mm -hmm. so I did it twice, which is pretty awesome. Um, we got a chance to create a cooking show in Haiti. Okay. Uh, we did two seasons, which is also amazing. We have a chance, we have a chance to put chefs who normally don't have the limelight or the, 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 the bright lights shining on them, give them the platform so they can showcase their talents. Okay. Right? So we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, travel for work, right? Uh, although it's strenuous and it can be tiring, but I enjoy traveling. I enjoy going to different areas, different countries, different states, mm -hmm. and cook for people and see the enjoyment in their face and that excitement, especially when they're like, chef, you gotta come back again. And I get repeated clients and stuff like that. So I enjoy that a lot about this career. And not in a million years did I know that cooking mm -hmm. would take me on a plane or put me in front of the TV. Mm. Right? Yeah, you know, it's not a TV that you can see it in any country in the world. Wow, right? that's amazing. So, yeah. I, I remember when I did Cutthroat, mm -hmm. one of my friends was in Australia. Oh, wow. And it was around 3 a.m. and he sent me a screenshot. Yo, guess what I'm watching? Mm. And I'm like, oh, that's me. <laughs> and that kind of like made me like, wow, you know, all this 
um, all this all, all the time that I, I pursued what I wanted to do it was well worth it. That's good. That's good. Um, we have another um, great question from our um, lovely audience. They want to know a little bit about your cooking style. How would you describe your cooking style? Oh, okay. So my cooking style, I like to describe it as fresh, bold, in your face. Okay. Um, none of that extra, you know, gimmicky stuff. I just like to use fresh, fresh ingredients. I believe in fresh ingredients. Mm -hmm. Of course, some dry ingredients are the only way you can get them is dry. That's the best way to use them. Mm -hmm. But I have to use fresh ingredients. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use frozen products. Uh, I like to use fresh as much as possible. Okay. Um, bold is about the flavors. Mm. Um, I like to test the limits. If I'm, if you ask me to do me, okay, I'm going all out. I'm bold. Okay, right. I'm testing, and I like to push the envelope. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's why I said it depends if I'm cooking for somebody that wants specifically, or if I'm if I'm being asked to cook for myself. Okay. So that's when I. You know, you can use some of the ABs or not too much as possible, but I always love to be able to give them some of our culture and what we're doing. So, um, and then in your face, I mean, that's what it is. Hot, hot, spicy stuff. You know, I love spicy stuff. You know, shout out to Adzik. Yes, you know? yes. Uh, I tasted that yesterday. I was like, ooh, I wasn't ready. Yeah, so <laughs> a little bit. Hot, hot sauce, yes. Yes, um, and of course, Chef KK with some of the marinade that we use. Yes, that we use. You yes. have to need that anyway. Right. Yes, yes. There's no good point if we have some barbecue also in the house. Right, right. yeah, barbecue. this is the scape of our culture. Like, you ask all Haitian people what we love, we got yeah. the pickles, all of it. Kind. So, you can coconut, coconut water, you know, sit by the beach, drinking coconut water with some lovely PK. Whoosh! Listen. It's it. So, <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can hear how everybody reacting right now because, like, lovely, you know, uh, the cock, like, we, we, and by the beach, they'll grill it on charcoal with some hot peppers and some lime juice, and boom, that's it, man. Enjoy yeah. it with your coconut, with a shot of barbecue on the side, and that's it. And the shuriken is something that we enjoy in every area in, in Haiti, you know? Yes. Especially when we're going away from school. Once you leave in school, the mushroom kun is right there. And then you have mushroom kun, yeah. bone kun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> with those sharp knives. Mm -hmm. And then you're peeling the shuriken, and then you're walking home, and you're chewing shuriken, you have friends with you. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's what makes Haitian culture. That's what makes Haitian food. That's what makes mm -hmm. it what we are so different, so special, you know, it's it's just our way of living. Right. We love life. We love enjoying life. And that's why Haitians do not negotiate, and I mean do not negotiate their Christmas period or their carnival. Mm. Don't play with that. Like yeah. had, I don't care how much turmoil or problem is going on in Haiti. Christmas time comes, all gang members put their guns down. Carnaval comes, everybody's in the carnaval party enjoying. Everything can start back afterwards, but during those two times, mm -hmm. we need peace and people are enjoying themselves because we love life. Okay, okay, sounds good. While we wait for the meat and for this, Chef, um, we had a really important question that came in for those that came late or did not hear about the importance of the APs as a foundation. We just want a small overview of what we did in the beginning, i.e., how did you um, how did you marinate the viand? Explain a little bit about the foundation of the APs, and also for people who may be in Australia watching and don't have access to Haitian APs, how do you compensate if you don't have those Haitian ingredients that you need? Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so we we just we we are doing today um, poulet au noix okay. or chicken with cashews. It is a dish that is very traditional to the northern side of Haiti, okay. right? Okap, you know, its surroundings, you know, in them, you know. Um, it's, I love the dish also because it brings back memories of Haiti, of my youth, and stuff like that. So, um, so it's pretty much, we used um, guinea hen, okay. or guinea fowl, or guinea fowl, we use guinea fowl. So we, What's the difference between that and a regular... Well, it's, it's, it's more it's more gamey, okay. and that's why that's 
the specific texts that we get, right? When mm -hmm. we when that they're called pool PE, yes. right? Or country chicken, country chicken right? Mm -hmm. It's that game taste that you get out of it. That's what sets it so much apart. Mm -hmm. And it's it's something that's not too it's not too meaty. Okay. Um and um it's a little tougher to cook. Okay. It takes a little more time to cook. That's why we, we use the pressure cooker okay. instead of using just a traditional stove um, to shorten the time and also that people can eat afterwards. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so pretty much um, we rinse uh, and this, this, this piece of meat, this protein, mm -hmm. if you find it in the soil, it'll also have some leftover uh, feathers and stuff okay. like that. So, you want to make sure that you clean that out. Mm -hmm. um, you use some lime or some vinegar or some sour orange to take out some of the gunk, some of the extra fat that's on it that's sticking on it. And also you use boiling water. Okay. And the boiling water helps open the pores mm -hmm. so you can be able to take out those pieces and also um, to clean it out. And also, um, you know, once fat gets hit with hot water, mm -hmm. it starts melting. So you yes. can top those extra uh, chunks of fat out of it. Okay. So then we spice it up with some APs, traditional Haitian APs, mm -hmm. which is traditionally um, thyme, parsley, scallions, mm -hmm. garlic, scotch bonnet pepper, oh, yeah. and you can use either lemon, limes, or we don't we don't have lemons in Haiti. We import lemons, but we don't grow lemons. We have limes, so citron, right? Mm -hmm. um, we use limes. Or you can use um, white distilled vinegar. Okay. Or if you want, you can add sour orange. Okay. Um, and that falls into your taste buds, your what you like the okay. most, the flavors that you should be go for, mm -hmm. right? Um, mostly, I like to use um, apple cider when I'm doing grill. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's that extra different taste, that okay. different kick, mm -hmm. that tank. Right there, you go. You know, like plain white vinegar is just plain white vinegar. Right. right. But, yeah. You know, once you start going to apple cider or white white vinegar, all those other vinegars, you have extra different flavors. Okay. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the basic ingredients and in APs you can find it in anywhere in the world. Okay. Right. Um, something that's probably really, really, really traditional to Haiti would be John John, which is our black trumpet mushroom, mm -hmm. which is which grows typically in Haiti. We harvest it there, and it's. It grows pretty much during rainy season. Okay. Because it's in the woods and it's like dark, moist areas. That's okay. right. That's especially where mushrooms grow, anyways. Mm -hmm. So, okay. but all these other ingredients, I'm pretty sure if you go to any store, okay. and whether it be um, Whole Foods or mm -hmm. your local store, you will find them and you can make your You just use your. Um, your mixer or your blender, and then or your pillow. Or a pillow. You go the traditional way. <laughs> Believe me, by the end of the day, your 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 dominant arm is gonna be stronger than your less dominant arm. So, but. so I'm glad that you said. Someone asked about where we um, ha we can find something like a piece because um, now that we have Mago Lakai, who's also a sponsor of this event, um, it's literally a Haitian marketplace. You want to find a chef like Chef Allen. You know what I'm saying? You want to find some ippies, some climas, anything. Just visit mangolakai.com and, you know, we'll bring Haiti to you. So um, that's a great way. You don't have to worry about not compensating. You'll find, you'll find the ippies. You'll find something. So, so I, I know we also spoke about how Haitian cuisine um, has some well, have, New Orleans cuisine has some ties with Haitian cuisine. Right? Yes, yes, I wanted so, us to come so back to that. This is a little history where, you know, we mm -hmm. did play a major part in the Louisiana acquisition. Oh, yes. So that means the Haitians were there for a period of time and they were bringing also their flavors to there. And that's why you hear also talking about Cajun cuisine mm -hmm. and Creole cuisine. Right. right. Creole cuisine in Louisiana is more close to ours. Yes. It's not typically ours, but it's close enough to ours. Right? Yes. Um, and also, let's not forget the French influence. You know, the French were the ones who were, um, who owned that territory at the point. Right? The and whole Louisiana the territory, territory, not just yeah, Louisiana not and New Orleans. No, the whole territory. Right. And remember that the French also occupied Haiti at one mm -hmm. point. 
and a lot of the techniques in the cuisine, they brought it with them also, some of their flavors, their, their ways, you know, bechamel, you know, beurre blanc, um, mm -hmm. you know, even the pastries, those things, we got influenced by them. Mm -hmm. So they also had the influence over there. So that's why you're going to see some similarities. You know, you got gumbo, yes. which is made with okra, right? Mm -hmm. You do kalalu gumbo. We call it kalalu gumbo in Haiti, which right. is okra gumbo. It's pretty much almost like repetitive, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, they use seafood a lot in their, in their area because, you know, they're close to the sea too, and then we use a lot of seafood in our in our cuisine. They use a lot of spices, you know, the Cajun, you know, the Creole spice is pretty spicy. We use a lot of spices also. Right. So that's... Um, you're going to see a lot of the, that connection between us and them. Yes. And shout out to all my Haitian chefs out there, my, my brother Chef Sebastian, right? That um, making strides with uh, Haitian food. Um, you know, they have jambalaya. We do Haitian jambalaya. We jo join with it, right? Um, so there's, there's a connection. And also, they're big at carnival. We're big at carnival. Right, so that's that red Mardi Gras, and that whole influence has influence, to do yes. with you know the impact of you know Haiti and yeah, all these and people it, coming to the revolution my, and afterwards. Yeah, like listen, the slave trade was by far the most influential thing that happened to the world, right? Because it spread out anywhere that had slave trade mm -hmm. or um, forced labor. Mm -hmm. You can see some similarities in their tech, in their cuisine, mm -hmm. and their cultures also. Right. You will see it, right? Because once you go somewhere, you bring your culture with you. I mean, in Miami, you'll see them in Little Haiti, they playing dominoes by the street. Mm -hmm. All right? So, yes, yeah. that's, that's how we play dominoes in Haiti. You know? yeah. like, <laughs> old people sitting by the streets and they play dominoes. You see in them, they have their... Um, the laundry pins mm -hmm. and their ears and stuff like that. So you bring your culture with you. Right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some of the paste. You said that's to thicken as well to thicken as, as you get extra flavor. Okay. 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 Yeah, because I'm used to flour and other things, but never using the actual ingredient. But I guess. So how much water do you add when you're? Um, Doing the cashew to get the. Um. Well. Um. There's no specific amount, mm -hmm. although I try to give uh, as much as I can a measurement. Mm -hmm. You know. Um. So you go by taste and also by the by the look of the sauce. Okay. You know, it depends on how how thick or thin you want the sauce to be. Okay. With can you fowl, do you want your sauce thick? With oh, guinea fowl, uh -huh. you don't want it too thick, too thick because um, you want to finish your, your guinea fowl and your sauce also. Okay. Right? okay. So you want it to pretty much um, graze okay. inside of it too. Will your meat somehow thicken your sauce? The or meat. No? Okay. Uh, but bone. Bone, bone as well. Food, okay. Right? That's why when you see when you do when you do sauce mm -hmm. with the meat inside of it, the bone, and then you put it in the fridge for mm -hmm. the next day. It's like a big gelatin. Yeah. It's because gelatin is made most gelatin is made out of bones. Oh. Right. Okay. So, um, so that's why they use to make gelatin. And of course, people who don't eat um, animal products, so mm -hmm. they're also non-animal product uh, gelatin available. So, so there's different type of thickening agents. Oh. Corn starch is a thickening agent. Okay. The what we call lamido. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, okay. You know. Um, Potatoes, mm -hmm. thickening agent. Yes. Flour. Um, yeah, different type of gelatin. Oh, seeds. you have a piece of chicken. Oh, no, no that's, that's not chicken. Yeah, that's, that's the flavor. Oh, yeah, okay. Bomb. Okay. Oh, my oh, chef, we have one question again um, from our audience members. So, someone is asking that sometimes when you put parsley in your ippies, it can make it bitter. Is that a balanced thing? How do you have you experienced that first of all, and how do you ensure that you have the right balance of the ingredients so you something is not overpowering the other, making it bitter? It depends on the type of parsley, also. Okay. Um, you know, you got curly parsley, you got flat leaf parsley, Italian parsley. Italian parsley. I like mm -hmm. to use Italian parsley because it doesn't have 
that strong bitter flavor. Okay. So you can use that. And also, and your APC you don't want to use too much parsley also. Okay. Right? Um, because yes, it can overpower and hide all these other ingredients that's already there. Okay. Okay. So pretty much right now, I'm just gauging to see the thickness I'm looking for. And if I need to add some more of my stock, I can add some more of the stock and then add my cashew. So I want to have that nice consistency, like I said, um, so it can get close to me, like some that coats. Okay. Right? Once you okay. post it on it, it just falls like smoothly. I see. So, would you say Haitian cuisine requires a lot of patience? I have friends that I like, give recipes to, and like you said, you were like, it's kind of like a lady, you have to love on it, give it some attention. I see that you, you're kind of really working your sauce, making sure it's the right consistency, everything is great. Would you say that it's a little bit more involved than some other things that you can freestyle or? Well, um, there, are two, there, there are two aspects of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's the put it there and let it go. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that it's also very popular in our cuisine. It's um, the long braising, okay. right? You know, especially when you cook in the video, you just clean it, add your spices, you put it there, you cover it up, you leave it alone, okay. right? And it cooks for long hours. Mm -hmm. and because of that cut of meat that we use, we use the shoulder, mm -hmm. which is really tough, mm -hmm. right? Or you're doing some uh, a piece of beef like the dog or like the pot roast, mm -hmm. it takes a long time to cook so the muscles can break down. Mm -hmm. So um, Asian cuisine is a labor of love, right? And um, it, it, it requires you to be patient and requires some things to take for a long period of time because if you have dinner at 6 o'clock and you're trying to do traditional Asian cuisine and you start at 4 o'clock, I'm sorry, my friend, you're not eating at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. right? There's no way. If you try to really do traditional, traditional, the techniques that we know, mm -hmm. that uh, traditional Tunisian cuisine, it won't happen in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. That's why when you grow up in Haiti, you can see that the ladies started cooking since 8 a.m. Uh -huh. uh, like, what? Why should the store so early, <laughs> right? And then next thing you know, it's 4 p.m. You're like, no, oh, food not done yet. Cook manje. Cook manje. Especially that we, um, and then back then we didn't have access to certain things like the pressure cooker or the right. slow cooker, things that can speed up the process, the cooking process for us, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you cook in cup in a regular stove. Mm -hmm. Trust me, you have to keep an eye on it because two, three hours later, it might still be really tough and the water might dry out. Mm -hmm. And then you end up breaking your lumbi. So you have to pay attention to it. Right. Right? So yes. that's what pretty much Asian cuisine is about. It's, it's a labor of love. You know, treat her right. You know, you have to caress her, you know, talk to her nicely. <laughs> yes, baby. You're almost there, sweetie. You know, sweet, sweet, sweetie. You know? <laughs> that's hilarious. And then you add a little something, something just yeah. to make sure. Because what you uh -huh. uh, pretty much braising is is cooking in liquid, right? Mm -hmm. It's the liquid. Okay. But you want to make sure that the liquid is part almost at half or three quarters to the um, where the protein is a little higher than the liquid. Okay, so it covers. So it doesn't the liquid doesn't cover the protein. That's oh. that's braising. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. I'm learning a lot. I hope everybody <laughs> out there is also learning a lot. So excited. So what? Oh, wait. So now I need some cashews. You know, you can't have, can't have enough cashews. You know, it's, it's chicken and cashews. So would there be any crunch to your cashew when you're done? Or should it should be cooked yeah. enough by the time you add the meat? That so that's why I'm saving some at the end. Okay. So you can just add these at the end and you can still get that crunch, that bite. Oh. Right? Um, when you're eating, mm -hmm. you want to eat, you want to have some bite, something that's a little tough, not tough, but you know, crunch. Okay. You know, it's like, there's always telling you, for example, for salad, you know, they tell you you have to have that dressing, mm -hmm. you have to have a crunch factor, you have to have a different element. Again, we're not babies, we're grown adults, mm -hmm. so we're not trying to eat German. Right, right. No, right? So, food. no baby food. So, we, right. we want to be able to bite into something, we need to have that crunch. Some of the items will be soft, mm -hmm. obviously, but the majority of it, you want to have a little crunch factor. Right. And that's why we set aside some peppers and onions 
You see, when the issue is done with the sauce, if you they just like drop it in there mm -hmm. and then turn off the stove. Mm -hmm. Right? And then when you're eating, you still have that crunch. Right. You never had pickles made with uh, Zoyo? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So, listen, I love pickles made with Zoyo over pickles with cabbage. So, that's my Oh, so thing. no cabbage made just, just Zoyo? Zoyo. Almost Straight like Zoyo. Almost. No. They call it salads. Oh. Right? Yeah, they call it salads. You know, it's lime juice, pima, the onions. A little bit of thyme, mm -hmm. uh, or even timalis. Timalis is pretty much similar to it too. Timalis is a um, shallot. What's timalis? Timalis is it's just almost a spicy sauce. Okay. I don't know if you know the history behind timalis. No. Ah, no. you know the story of Buki and timalis? Of course. So I didn't go to it. the story behind it is that Buki every time timalis made a food mm -hmm. and he leaves. By the time he comes back home, the food is done. Okay. Okay, ate it. Every time, every time. So Timali said again, man, it's like, yo, I can't understand this. I'm gonna get him. So Timali said, makes this sauce, mm. right, which is known with shallots, uh, some thyme, some scotch garlic pepper, and some salt. You can add a little bit of olive oil into it also. Mm -hmm. So he poured it over the mushy. Whoosh! And then that was Buki. And Buki, what you get the food? You know, Buki's big fish here, you know, very greedy. So he jumps on the food, heads on, not even thinking it's time to taste it, and mm -hmm. just start going down. And then by the time he's like eating, and his mark, mouth started to burn, mm -hmm. and he started to sweat, and then Buki goes, Woo! That's what's so <laughs> <laughs> goes, And there goes the legend behind it. I, I do not know if it's true or not, but this, <laughs> is, <laughs> this is the legend, the story behind sauce <laughs> That's good, that's good. So we've talked about how delicious Haitian food is, and you know, they might call it bias because, you know, so much flavor. When I cook some people Haitian food, they said, Marie, girl, I feel like I'm having a party in my mouth. So since our food is so awesome, why do you feel like Haitian food is not worldwide or more popular? <clears throat> Oh Lord. Mm. Oh, sorry. Oh. That's a mm, that's a great question. Uh, okay. So our food is very, very similar to it's a lot of our dishes are one pot dishes. Okay. Right? There are a lot of one pot dishes. Um, and that's why I always say that you need to know the story, the history of the country. When okay. you're looking at the food, and the food will tell the history of the country. Okay. Right? So we didn't have access, the slaves didn't have access to the prime cuts. Okay. The prime ingredients. So we were just cutting whatever you have, and then cooking for a long period of time until it gets to that doneness that they can eat. Until okay. it becomes edible, then they have it. So right. Um, so. Sorry, I got lost a little bit. The question was again. Cessation food is all that in the back of Oh, why is, why is not popular? Okay, so yeah, so um, culturally, culturally, we eat for to satisfy our hunger. We don't eat for the pleasure of food. You might enjoy the food, you might love it, but mm -hmm. ninety percent of Haitians eat just to eat, mm -hmm. not to die of hunger. Okay. So. We are not accustomed for food to be an art. Okay. The moment you present Asian food as an art, you get lambasted, right? It's like, oh, so fella, kitiba asa, like, he's not supposed to feed, how is that going to fill me up, right? They don't see it as the art that we're trying to present it into. And uh, until we can. I, I, I can't even say a week ago, I can't convince somebody to open their mind. Until we accept as a community to open our mind, to open our, um, to open our, uh, our mind to accepting that Haitian food can be presented in a different manner, can mm -hmm. be done in a different manner. Right? Until you can do that, until you open your mind, and to explore different foods of different cultures. Okay. Right? Because once you get exposed to foods of different cultures, that's when you can see how food is presented. Right? And again, shout out to all the major chefs who are doing their utmost best to present different foods and a different life. 
right. you know, such a lot in the house, man. If you guys visit this season team page, right. I guarantee you that you will see Haitian food with a different eye. Okay. You know, and that, that's where we need to be. We need to step away from, listen, there's no problem with having the food for food, just for eating, right? They are cut, they are written to that, they are pushing for that. But also we need to start having those places where Asian food is, is seen as fine dining. Right, fine dining. I go and I have this little mother portion of food and I'm paying 30, 40, 50 dollars for it. I'm not paying it for the food. I'm paying it for the experience. Mm -hmm. Because the chef or the team that's behind the scenes is creating that experience for me. Right. To get you to, to take you to different levels, to different because what you eat, you travel. Mm. When you eat food, you travel. Yes. Right? And eat Indian cuisine. You eat traditional Indian cuisine, you travel back to India. The smell, the spices. You go to an Indian market, the smell alone takes you to the market over there. Mm -hmm. Right? So we need to be able to do that with the Indian food. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be afraid that oh, we're going to get criticized, or oh, people are not going to understand it. Listen, everybody, every, everything is not meant for everybody. Correct. Right? And, you know, we have, stick, we, we have to have chefs who stick to their just belief that, yes, let's present this season to the next level. Mm -hmm. So that the outside community, the Michelin star people, mm -hmm. can be like, okay, you know, wow, this is, this is up to par. Right. Right? right. Like, you can't pack as much flavor in a small place that you did in a big place. It's just about the technique. The ingredients that you use, mm -hmm. and you present it nicely, and you get all those flavors. You know, I hate when I hear people say, oh, salam mm -hmm. Because it doesn't look like what we're accustomed to. And here you were accustomed to big plate of rice, a little bit of meat, a bunch of sauce, and then boom, you're done. Mm -hmm. Or you have that bunion, grillo, tons of pickles, right? Yeah. But they never see it beyond that. Right. And I don't blame them because we never were exposed to it. Culturally, that doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. Right? So the moment that we start seeing it differently, mm -hmm. that's when Asian food can Asian food can rival with any cuisine around the world. Sure. Alright? Listen, I, I believe that. If Mexican cuisine can be recognized mm -hmm. by UNICEF as one of the leading cult living cuisine in the world, mm -hmm. our food can too. Yes. And they eat crickets and they eat worms. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if it can be at that level, we can do it too. Mm -hmm. I participated in this in this festival in Mexico mm -hmm. back in 2016. Right? Mm -hmm. And they call it um, it was the traditional cuisine um, something. But it was about traditional cuisine. And there were countries from different, there were people from different countries, like over 30 countries. Mm -hmm. And then, since it was being done in Mexico, they had, I'm telling you, those those viejas, those old ladies, old school ladies, all the old, those, like, pretty much the patriarch or matriarch of those regions in Mexico, mm -hmm. and they had their own booth. Wow. So Guadalajara, you see this region, you see that region, and they were doing food, traditional cuisine from their region. Mm. But at the same time, there were the new chefs, the new age chefs that were showing that same food, but taking it to the next level, using molecular gastronomy, using other techniques that mm -hmm. are not traditional, but they celebrated the cuisine mm -hmm. that was traditional, but it was still modern. Right. Right? They, 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 they say, we respect the traditional cuisine, mm -hmm. and the respect that you have for the traditional cuisine will help you be able to push for the modern cuisine. That's right? excellent. And that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to embrace, like, not say that, oh, that's not Asian cuisine when somebody showcases it a different way. Right. Just say that, oh, that's different. Mm -hmm. But embrace it. Try it. And yeah. try it because who knows? And also, you, we want people to accept our food and Two things. If somebody has tried to cook our food, we criticize them, mm -hmm. right? But if you start going crazy, putting pumpkin, uh, like um, sweet cream cans and, <laughs> and stuff like that in the soup, no, nah, that's crazy right there. Don't do that. Don't do that, you know? <laughs> We're not going to go there. Yeah. But I'm saying that if somebody has a, another person who's like, they should 
I, I follow this Instagram page and this lady there's this lady, she goes back, no problem, mm -hmm. social media. She's a white person, not white as in the skin color, mm -hmm. like white, white. But what she's not from, she's not Haitian at all. Mm -hmm. But she cooks Haitian food. Mm -hmm. She's, uh, she should have seen how many people were getting on her. Oh, you're not even Haitian, why are you doing vegan Haitian food? But we were supposed to be accepted. Right. And the minute that all the culture is doing it, we get mad. Yeah. Oh, they're trying to appropriate a culture. <laughs> How do we expect them to appreciate our food if they don't cook it ourselves? We're on, we're on social media showing how to do Haitian food. This is how you do beef for it. This is how you do grill. But the minute the blood start doing it, no, don't do it. Mm, no, we have to do that. How are you going to teach your own food, your own culture to your own people only? Mm. You can't be a prophet in your own town only. Why are you prophesizing? Why are you teaching? You gotta pray. You gotta, you gotta open up to the world and let people appreciate it and let people who want to try to do it to do it also. Mm -hmm. And then also, you have those amazing chefs that are doing amazing work trying to elevate the cuisine and present it differently. Mm -hmm. We just have to keep that, leave that mentality of, I'm sorry for the word, but always baffling. No matter who's not baffling, said no. You have to be able to appreciate food. <laughs> appreciate food. Enjoy food. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are experiences that you get when you go to certain restaurants and it's called chef's table. You get 16 different courses. Right. But if you expect it to be 16 different courses that are like the same big kind of food you get, by the second or third course you're done, you can't experience it. Yeah. And then, but you want to have that little bite to enjoy. And I guarantee you that those bites or those two, three bites are packed with flavors. Because the, the chef and the team that's working behind the scenes to give you that experience, I guarantee you they work tirelessly, mm -hmm. long hours to be able to pack all those flavors in that little portion that they're giving you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. the, minute, the minute we do that, Haitian food will be like, it's already, a lot of people know it already, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, what is most known is what we sell pretty much in the restaurant here. Because we try to appease palates. Right. You know, brio, pull free, poisson free, poisson sauce, non beef, right? Zigo, the ginger, job. Haitian food is so much more than that. Right. right? You got pisquet, you know, you got all those ingredients that we have in Haiti from different regions, mm -hmm. and we don't even try to use them or teach them here. It's not so good. Oh, wow. Right. Woo! Do you have more? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so pretty much done. So now we're gonna add it to the sauce. Oh, All right. Nice. Yes. Ooh. See, I promise you guys, we're not gonna be too long. We don't have to be an hour yet, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're not gonna be too long. They're yeah. they're going to see how you know that's presented, how it's how it tastes. Chef, I haven't seen you taste one time. I know you're a professional, but for the rest of us, you know. For the rest of us who wants to know, you know, for the rest of us who want to know how the food tastes as we're doing it, yes, you how do you build up on your flavor? You have, to taste, you, as, you have to taste as you go. Yes, I totally agree with that one. Uh, it's, it's habit of knowing the flavors I'm going for. So you already know. It's, it's, yes. it's already the habit, so I know. You know, it, it, it's just something about when you, like, for example, when you're putting salt into it, mm -hmm. like, I guarantee you, if you if you're doing the same thing over a thousand times, your finger is gonna be used to that weight. You know, yeah. You're gonna know, like you're gonna know exactly. You know, it's like when the those those uh, people who like to travel a lot to go back and forth to Haiti mm -hmm. with their mallet, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, it's not going to Because you know, it has to be overweight for them to be happy. Yes, mm -hmm. it has to be. <laughs> so that's the thing. Oh, you taste it? Okay. Yes. Bounce light to the tree. And then I'm going to add <coughs> a little added to it. Ooh, okay. A little kit. Yeah, All right. right. So don't kick us too hard now. <laughs> All right. Chef, do you mind if I invite um, Chef Sebastian up? Oh, yes. Please. Right here. Please. I'm eager to eat. But we want to know from another chef, you know, if you, you know, 
Please do, please. You want to know from another chef what's going on here? Please do. <laughs> chef Sebastian, please so do. So we're going to introduce <laughs> Chef Sebastian. He's going <laughs> to help us finish up and help us taste this. You yes. want to know if Chef Ale, you know. If I miss the If Chef Ale did the thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come in, Chef Chef Sebastian, how you doing? Up, Ooh, that chicken is falling on the ball. Hello, everybody. You know, <laughs> tell them about yourself, you know, that you're local. Yes, I am local. I'm in the DMV area. I am the Haitian chef. And my goal is, like um, Chef LeBaron was saying, is really to show the world that Haitian cuisine is really king. So that's what I do. And that's my name on Instagram, to Cuisine King. Thank you. Nice. Woo! That looks good. So there's some sauce at the bottom of there. Are you going to get rid of that, or will that get incorporated into this sauce? We're going to add some of it to it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Feel free to ask. We want to know if the chef, you know, did the did if the, I did the if thing. You know, or if I did the thing. If I did the thing. If I missed the thing, or if I did the thing. If you did the thing, you know. The right. The right. So. Yeah. So this. So this is how you know it's guinea fowl versus. Um, or the chicken, mm -hmm. it's, once it's cooked, yes. you can see the color, okay. the difference in color. You can see, you know, like the meat, like you can see it's like a gamey meat, it's like a tough cut of meat really, versus mm -hmm. the regular chicken that, you know, we have all over the stores. Pull blanc. Pull blanc. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pull pee right here. Oh, I have a question about pull blanc too. So I know that with pull blanc, because I saw that you added some water there, right? Um, in the in the thing. The, the, so the stock. In the stock. Yeah. So pull that white chicken. Sometimes it has a lot of water in it. Uh, does this chicken will that give you all that water, or you have to add the water? When no, you this won't give you that much water as the other one. It does, or it won't. No, not? Doesn't, no. Okay. The one thing about the pull blanc also is that a lot of it is pumped with uh, sodium water. Okay. Like. You can go to the store and you see those big packs, those packs of chicken breasts, mm -hmm. and you see that chicken, that chicken breast look like it, it's been in the gym for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. If you read the label correctly, it'll say that it's pumped with sodium water. Oh wow! So they pump it with a lot of water so it can be plumpy and stuff like that. I mean, once you cook it, if you cook it right, too, it's gonna be very juicy. Mm -hmm. But it's not natural, right? Mm -hmm. Chickens are not that big naturally, you know. It's, you can't have a chicken breast that looks like a turkey breast. Like, right. So. so, um. Yeah. You have a question? Oh, no, your yeah, mic. We just want to make sure your mic was on. It's good. Yeah. Alright, so we're going to just finish it off with the leftover of the cashews, right? And we're going to add the peppers and onions. Normally, I would let this simmer for another 30 minutes. Okay. But we don't have that much time for the other day, so we're just gonna keep it like that, right? For that like crispiness you said earlier? Yeah, so we're gonna add these to get that crispiness. Ooh, that looks beautiful. Oh. Okay. 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 Alright, go. Stir it up. Now the moment of truth, right? It's the not, moment of the truth. The moment of truth is not the chicken. It's the rice. It's the rice. Will the rice be staring back at you? Yes. <laughs> if you see that I put back the carver on it, that means a failed mission, right? Okay. So we're gonna go a tiny. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm very satisfied with what we have. Yeah. It looks good. 
It smells so good. Now, just so the audience can see a little presentation. So we're yes. Gonna, we're going to do a little plate. presentation. Okay. We have a okay. white plate or something. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to let my brother here, Chef Sebastian, assist me on the plating. White plate. Yeah, your white plates. Right. Up top. Okay. So, Chef Sebastian blessed me with this pack of micro greens and micro flowers. So we're gonna garnish our dish. So I don't know if there's any more questions you know, from everybody watching or any questions from everybody here. Is there ever experience in Africa? In Africa? In Africa. Woo! Yes! 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 Listen, we all know how like that we do have connections with Africa. We know our that's where our ancestors came from and all that stuff. But you don't realize it until you actually go there. Like, I went, I was in Kenya and I was um, working on a project with a friend of mine to open a restaurant. And my time there, I spent two weeks and those were some of the most amazing two weeks in my life. Um, not only culture-wise, but also food-wise. Um, they're very, they're very, they have very uh, um, deep flavors. Um, I don't want to say they can compare to ours, but they have rich flavors that they use to, and they use a lot of organic items, right? And that, that also blew my mind, the culture, how the people are friendly and welcoming. They remind me of the old Haiti, right? Like where people are friendly and welcoming. And, you know, we went to the market and I was walking around and I saw these guys, they were playing chess. And I said, oh, can I jump in? And they were so happy to let me play with them. And I'm talking about, like, elders that could be my dad, right? They didn't have no judgment, nothing. They said, oh, yeah, sure, sit down. And then we sat down, I played chess with them. I tried with one, one time, but the other time, I got hooked, you know? These guys, that's what they do every day. They just sit there and play games. So. But the experience is amazing, man. Um, if you ever get a chance to travel, to the motherland, please do, because it is an unparalleled experience. And it's something that you will cherish for the rest of your life. Sebastian is amazing, he's a White House chef, yeah, so yeah. we have like white, that White House up in here, and also for you, um, Chef uh, Romeo, someone wanted to know any big plans that you have for helping Haitian food go international? Um, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> can, um, we, 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 do, we do have some plans on doing some stuff, you know, um, Chef Sebastian has a cooking has a cooking as a cookbook. It's out already. It's called Counting Cuisine. Uh, Counting Cuisine is with K. Counting Cuisine with K also. So you guys can check it out. Um, we have some other amazing Asian chefs. We have great cookbooks out already. We have Nadish Fleury more. Mm -hmm. I know some other chefs that are working on theirs. <coughs> I'm working on mine too, but I don't know when it's coming out yet. Right? <laughs> uh, but other than that, we do have projects that we're trying to to make sure that us chefs, we collaborate more, um, we have more of a foundation so we can showcase the food to the next level and help the upcoming chefs too who are looking up to us who want to elevate Asian cuisine also. Okay, very nice. So we're about to do some plating. Let me make sure you have a, a big spoon for the sauce. Yes. So, so this is uh, this is what happens behind the scene. Yes, yeah. behind the scene. The consort, the consorting. So uh, technically, when you do plate, you do mm -hmm. want you want to have. Uh, I know in Haitian cuisine, we don't really kind of go by those norms, but if we want to bring Haitian cuisine to the world stage, mm -hmm. these are some of the rules that we have to follow. So uh, technically, when you do plate, um, you have to be really mindful of. Um, 
spaces on the negative spaces. So that's why when you go to a fine dining restaurant, you see the portions are small. The portions are small because of the simple fact that um, um, you get not only five to ten courses, but by the time, by the end of the, the meal, you're full. So for us, most of the time we get rice, the chicken, and the toga, we put it all on one plate. So that's why we typically see that the portions are smaller. So I usually, we would definitely use a, a, a ring mold, but we don't have a ring mold. And as a great cook or a great chef, we have to always improvise. So we're going to use a regular cup. So we're just going to scoop the rice. Uh, and it might not make a mold because the rice is really, really uh, thin. So if you really wanted to have that mold, and, and Chef Lemaire is going to improvise, you just add a little bit of oil just so the rice can stick together. And if you want it to stick, you just make it just a little bit, about to about no, but just a little bit. Uh, um, Under water. Yeah. So you just want to. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> so, um, you typically have a ring mold. So the ring mold usually is usually a round instrument, and you put the rice in there. Like a cookie cutter. Like a cookie cutter, and it comes with the top. And the top, um, I usually have one. Not today is the day that I don't have it. Um, you press it so the rice could hold the form. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of uh, make sure that. It holds the shape, and it holds the shape, hopefully that's pretty that it comes out. You can either put it on the center or to the side a little bit. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, you can put it on the center or on the side a little bit. Just, um, again, we just want to make sure we have as much negative space on the plate as possible. So we're just going to do, so the plating that we're going to do, we're just going to do like a straight line, because it's a rectangle plate, we're going to do a straight line across. So we're just going to put the rice right here. So rice is good. Oh, nice. Good. That will make up this And then you want to make sure that um, you clean. You, know, you want to make sure that you're working. Because, again, having Haitian food as as uh, uh, bringing to the world stage is an art. So eating like this is, is more than than just eating, like Chef Lemire was saying earlier. It's an art. So you want to make sure that the food is well presented. So you want to make sure that you're cleaning up as much as possible. So you want to make sure you remove all that. Uh, any, any excess. Yeah, so technically, when you go to like a fine dining restaurant, that's how the process works. There's usually like 50 people working, so usually one person is plating. Mm -hmm. And that's where the price goes up. Mm -hmm. Because there's an army of people working in the kitchen. Okay. And everybody's responsible for one element okay. that goes in your plate. Yeah. Okay. Like somebody's doing the rice, somebody's doing the chicken, somebody's doing the sauce, somebody's doing the garnish. Mm -hmm. And then the chef. The executive chef or the sous chef of the night, it makes sure that it analyzes your plate to make sure that it is up to par before it goes out to the guests. Okay. Yeah. So that's why when you have a traditional restaurant where there's 10 people, like one of the best restaurants in the U.S. Um, is called Linear. They have 300 people working. Wow. And this, you get the ultimate fine dining experience of your life. Wow. So, um, And as also, you know, we're talking about portions, you know, that's really good for your waistline too. That, is, that, to that is really good for your waistline. <laughs> and, and, and like, um, Chef Lemaire made a great point earlier is that a lot of us, because of, and, and that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about, the history, mm -hmm. a lot of the things that we eat are because of the fact that a lot of times when we were in slavery, people used to eat just to keep them full. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of, t a lot of times that's why when we eat, we eat the uh, mining land in the morning and we don't eat it until late in the, in the day. Because usually when we when the people had to do the sugar cane and be in the, um, in the field. on the field, that's what that's how they used to eat. So that's why now, even here in America, if you go to the south, that's how they eat. So it's just a thing yes. just to keep us going. So you wanna um, you know you just wanna look for the absolute best uh, 
cuts, the, the ones that look the best. You don't want to put too much in there, but just for uh, presentation's sake, um, you could do, let's just do two because I want the color on this. But typically we just do, we just do one. so that it can be used to garnish a plate for, for the visual effect, right? Again, you eat with your eyes, yes. right? Your eyes are the main thing that tells you whether or not you're going to tear this up or you're just going to pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so most of the time, if the food, sometimes the food might not taste good, but if it looks good, you want to eat it. Yes. <laughs> and that's when you're going to say it's not, if it's not taste, if it doesn't taste good. But, you know, most of the time we say that if it looks good, it might taste good. So, so we want to go for both. Yeah. Look <laughs> good and taste Whoosh, good. Whoosh, I don't see Manger fleury. Whoosh. Okay. We. Oui. And, and one, another reason you know, chefs like myself and Chef Lemaire mm -hmm. likes to use the flowers. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's all about representing Haiti. When you think of Haiti, you think of all different types of beautiful flowers, lands, greens, the plains. So it's just all this is represented. So really, the dish is really a full representation. If you see all the dishes that I cook, everything is really about putting Haiti in the fullest of light as possible. That looks amazing. So that's it. And there you go. So do you focus on one area of the plate? I see how you guys have like a really nice. So it all depends. So it's not like all over the place. It, you just don't. The, the, the worst thing, you know, the worst thing we get from, the one thing that you want really to put Haitian food on the map we have to get away from is really piling so much food on the plate. So you want to do as much negative space as possible. Okay. And it's, it's, it's where it's the science and also it's better with our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when we look at the plate, and it just, just looks, it just looks better. Yeah. If, if you have the food all over the place, you get lost, right? Yeah. You get lost, you don't focus much on the ingredient. But if you have the food centered or in one specific area of the plate, like Chef said, with the negative space, you know, like you have the negative space in the background, your eyes tend to go towards that. Wow. Versus when you have the food all over the place, <laughs> but when you when you have it like this, once you put once you put the plate in front of you, of course they're gonna put it at six o'clock, like the meat facing you first. Right. So you're gonna be like, oh wow, you are just looking at here instead of looking at here, then you're looking there, you're looking there, stuff like that, and you lose focus on what is the essence of the dish. That's true. Well, you want to count it combien bon? No, no, no. Right. Well, like we said, we're going to have um, Chef taste it for the yes, moment. Yes, please, yeah. Real quick. Of and, course. And, you know, yes, of course. Chef has to taste it. Yeah. This has been such an amazing experience, amazing conversation. Um, and I know it's about to be delicious, and I can't wait. This is Baba Bazu.
Microgreens are edible. You, yes. you know that Amy Mitchell song? Bagamati Nasa. Wow. This has a more good day. I mean, so I don't want to eat the whole, you know, and, and also, when, when the fine dining, it's like, all right, you don't want to eat too much. You want to take your time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, exactly what they just talked about. I was like, what is that ceremony? <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Chef Le Maire. We are honored you. to have you here today, and we are really grateful for this experience and this opportunity. I know I learned a whole lot, and I hope that you know everyone watching really enjoyed this presentation. We are excited to have closed up um, out Black History Month this way. Don't forget to visit AHB online and on Facebook, as well as Mangu Lakai for everything Haitian and. Thank you so much, and we look forward to bringing more of this to you. And please keep in touch. Let us know what you like and what more you'd love to see. We're excited that Amen Production was here with us. They brought all of the visuals that you see, and I have my fellow uh, members from AHP as well, Mongo Lakai here. Thank you so much for being here. Chef Sebastian, thank you for stopping by and for some of the plating tips that you gave and being our taster for the evening. And um, Good night. Thank you.